Motion sickness, also commonly called travel sickness, is the constellation of symptoms that can result from physical or visual motion. Physical motion causing the symptoms is termed motion sickness, while visual stimuli causing symptoms is called visually induced motion sickness. It's also important to distinguish that a degree of sickness in response to these stimuli is expected, whereas a disproportionate reaction affecting life can be considered a disorder. Stimuli can broadly be divided into physical such as vehicles, behavioural and visual. It has been found that motion around the 0.2 Hz frequency is most correlated with development of symptoms, with frequencies much higher or lower not generally causing symptoms. Train travel and cornering in cars tends to be around the 0.2 Hz frequency, and so tend to cause symptoms. Examples of low frequencies would be on cruise carriers, and high frequencies being riding a horse. Some behavioural components can perpetuate the symptoms, mainly those causing conflicting inputs from the visual and vestibular systems, the classic example being reading in a moving car. The vestibulo-ocular reflex moves the eyes to maintain fixation on an external object that is moving relative to the head, which conflicts with fixating on the text which is stationary relative to the head and doesn't need the same eye movement. The symptoms can be triggered outside of physical motion as well. For example, when motion is perceived whilst stationary, such as simulators, virtual reality or computer displays. The exact mechanisms by which nausea and vomiting are elicited by motion are not entirely understood, but it is well known that there are extensive connections between the vestibular system, ocular motor and autonomic centres within the central nervous system. People who have non-functioning vestibular ocular systems are immune to motion sickness and the intensity of the motion correlates with the speed of symptom onset. It is most common in ages between 2 and 12 years and is more common in females than in males. Some research has shown symptoms to be three times more common in those who cannot see the road compared to those who could. It is also more common in those who suffer from migraines and have a family history of motion sickness, as well as in pregnancy and those using hormonal contraception. The characteristic features are nausea, vomiting, a vague abdominal discomfort, often accompanied by dizziness or vertigo. A phenomenon called the avalanche phenomenon exists where once the person has nausea, even if they are removed from the motion, the symptoms can continue worsening until vomiting. There can also be autonomic disturbance, such as diaphoresis, meaning sweating, pallor or flushing, as well as dry mouth or even excessive salivation. In rare instances, prolonged vomiting may lead to dehydration requiring fluid resuscitation. A diagnosis is made clinically, meaning no specific test or imaging is needed for it. Episodes of motion sickness are characterised by four criteria. Presence of the symptoms as a result of motion at a greater than minimal severity. Symptoms appear during motion and increase with exposure. They eventually stop after cessation of the stimuli and are not better accounted for by another condition or cause. To make a diagnosis of motion sickness disorder, there must be five episodes from the same stimuli, symptoms are reliably triggered by the same or similar stimuli, repeated exposure does not significantly diminish the severity, and symptoms result in behavioural changes such as avoidance of triggering factors, and again no other cause or condition can better explain the presentation. Differentials include migraine, inner ear disease or gastrointestinal disease such as food poisoning or gastroenteritis, the development of symptoms in someone with risk factors for stroke without previous motion sickness, acute intracranial pathology should be considered. There should be no focal neurological deficits on physical exam. 
In general, treatment is more effective when used prophylactically, as symptoms are more challenging to control once they have started. Non-pharmacological measures include controlled breathing, which helps reduce anxiety, as anxiety is known to enhance motion sickness, not eating or drinking excessively or drinking alcohol before travelling, being positioned so that the person is able to see the direction of travel or where motion is minimised, for example the centre of a ship, avoiding the use of devices or reading during travel, and ensuring fresh air. Habituation is a commonly used method where the individual undergoes repeat exposures briefly as part of a desensitisation regime. However, over time, the person tends to return to baseline without repeat exposures, though symptoms do generally improve with age, and vomiting itself is less common after the teenage years. Alternative therapies that may help, but are largely unproven, include bands that apply acupressure or electrical stimulation, and ginger. Pharmacological options include hyacine hydrobromide, which can be oral or transdermal patches, and is known as scopolamine in the United States. It is often used in those over 12 years of age, commonly as a patch behind the ear. Anticholinergic side effects of this medication include drowsiness, dry mouth, blurred vision, and bradycardia. Antihistamines are another option, with sedating ones seemingly being more effective, for example cyclozine or diphenhydramine, and antidopaminergics can also be used, like promethazine.